Hi guys. Hey dudes. This is Gary. How's it going? Uh, he was the first sound guy at the Oasis for a long time. And now he's on to bigger and better things. And he works at the Bottom Lounge. Uh, actually, you work for a pretty cool sound company. Yeah, it's uh, called Big Audio. And we have a lot of venues in Chicago. Um, Subterranean, the Beat Kitchen. Uh, it's a new one called Thalia Hall that just opened. And uh, we do a lot of street fests in the summer, too. Yep, from the streets. <laughs> so uh, he's, he was kind enough to assemble a bit of a a bullet point list of things that uh, bands could do to kind of help their stage, uh, their process in terms of when you get to a venue, as well as, uh, you know, how to go through sound check and all that stuff. And we've all done it, and we've probably all broken some pretty valuable rules. Uh, so hopefully this will kind of kind of help out. You know, it, re realistically, I think, you know, m more than anything, what, what bums me out if I play a show is when there's bad sound. Or if I go to see a show, Gary and I were just talking about that. Uh, but in, when, I, when I play a show and I'm de if I feel like it's bad sound, um, you know, I try to help the sound guy as much as I can. And not by saying, hey man, you should turn up the, the vocals because no one likes hearing that. Sound guy knows, and he probably knows the system better than you. Um, so next thing you know, when there's bad sound, and everyone's kind of feeling it. The sound guy gets a little irritable, and then that doesn't that doesn't help anything. So suddenly, uh, no one's having fun. The band and the sound guy. Uh, so if you kind of uh, use a lot of the tips that are in here, in theory, that makes the sound guy's life easier. He's going to like you more, and may actually care about making you sound good. No promises, but uh, it, it improves your odds. Uh, does everyone who wants one? Do you all grab a? One of the outlines, they're over there on the table behind that sweet couch. Just in case, I figured I'd throw that out there. Anything to uh, add thus far? Uh, I mean, I guess uh, when uh, I started, I started doing sound when I was about 18, and up until that point, I'd been playing in bands and stuff, and I, I definitely had the, um, the stereotype of the grumpy sound engineer like built into my head from playing you know really small rooms where the guy doesn't really seem to care about your band and is a little bit uh you know absent-minded seeming um but that really doesn't hold up most of the time you're the majority of the time the sound guy is on your team if y if at least you put in a little bit of effort to show him that you care about what he's doing or she um Female sound engineers? Yeah, they, they what? They do exist, and they they are good. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, first things first is any any place you're playing, no matter what, always go and introduce yourself to people first. the The thing that people hate the most is when you walk in and you act like you own a place. If you go in and introduce yourself, act even just the slightest bit humble and thankful to be in a room it's going to make things a thousand times easier from the get-go. Yeah, if what it's worth, we're kind of going to stick to a, a guideline that's when you're going to play at a venue, you know, playing house parties or playing, you know, a place that has like little PA, you know, speakers on a, on sticks and a box mixer, that doesn't necessarily ap apply. I mean, some, some of it does, but uh, this is, this is ideally for when you're working your way up the venue ladder and you start, start small like Oasis and you work yourself up to say something like the bottom lounge, which I hope all of you are fortunate enough to do because that place rules. Okay, uh, so starting off, upon arrival, hopefully, you know, it's not on here, but uh, we've talked about it before. Hopefully you got there early, not just on time, early. Uh, venues love that. Introduce yourself and if you can, remember their names. No, you know, no harm in writing it down. That's a tough one, and no one's going to fault you for not remembering their name. It's one of those things, you're walking into a room where everyone else is learning about 20 new names every day, too. So no one's going to be mad at you for not remembering. But if you do, it's, it just helps that much more. Because nobody wants to hear, hey, sound guy. That's, that's not fun. At the Oasis, uh, Joyce, the, the president, she, uh, she calls them sound monkeys, which they actually... They, they don't like that at all either, so <laughs> I wouldn't do that, just to, just to throw that out there. Um, 
Okay. Uh, find out where to load in your stuff. You know, don't just walk in with a, a 412 cab when you when you walk in the door for the first time. Usually there's going to be a specified area. And if you play a cool venue, chances are they're going to help you. You know, last, last time I played the Metro, I was opening my the lift gate on my car and like these guys just started diving in and carrying all the stuff. It was amazing. So, you know, just hold out. Just, just, just ask. Make sure you know uh, where... Oh, Chris, you have a question. Into the mic. Yeah, I nice. I would, I would say that if uh, someone's just helping you take stuff out of your car, you should probably make sure they work for the venue first. <laughs> you, you, know, you actually don't have to worry too much about that because if anything's too heavy, heavier than, for, than they can run away with, they're not going to help you for without money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, and, but honestly, I was just so spent already in the day. So, like, I was going to roll the dice. I'm like, these guys might steal my stuff, but they might carry it inside. So I'll, we'll see where this goes. If they ask what's your lightest, most valuable item, then <laughs> maybe. <laughs> they didn't. You don't tell them about the boutique effects pedal you have. Nope. No, but they grabbed the Wurlitzer first. So, <laughs> their loss. Um, okay, so uh, uh, and we're still in the first little bullet points here. Um, be, pre be as prepared as you can with all of your gear off stage, so that way you can save time. Uh, you know, just start setting things up as best you can. Uh, drummers, put your cymbals on stands. You know, get your pedal board kind of ready with some cables kind of ready to go. If you have a head and cab, plug the head into the cab. I can't stress this enough. Uh, just, you know, anything that you can do off stage before you get on stage to, to make the process, you know, rapid, do it. You know, so as, far, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, I've never ascended to the, the, the great levels that Gary has in terms of sound guy status. Uh, but the times that I, I have to do sound, the bands that are on stage ready to go and off stage rapidly are easily my favorite bands. Regardless of what music they played, I'm just like, oh, these guys are amazing. They're making my life easier. Yeah. Um, and as far as the getting set up off stage thing goes, uh, guitar players, if you are using any more than just a tuner pedal and you don't have a pedal board, you definitely need to go get one. There, I mean, there's still plenty of high-end touring acts that are setting up five or six pedals in a chain without a board, and it takes up so much time. It makes everybody angry. Yeah, I watched Jimmy Eat World at the Metro uh, 10 or 15 years ago, and the guy, uh, the main lead singer, Jim, had six pedals, and he, he just brought them out and just started taping them to the floor. It added at least 20 minutes to the, to the set change. I could not believe it. I'm like, these guys are total pros, except for that. <laughs> what a bummer. <laughs> uh, Okay, and then you know, always check in and see see what the what the flow of the show is going to be in terms of uh, what is the order, you know, uh, set time, sound check, door, anything like that. Hopefully, you're playing a show that you can get there and sound check before the door opens. That's always ideal. Uh, it doesn't always work out. Um, sometimes I don't know if you guys are familiar. There's two different types of checks. Usually, a sound check and a line check. Line check is you know primarily just making sure that all the microphones are, yeah. why don't you explain? Yeah, I mean, the big difference is uh, line check is um, really just making sure that the mic is on and in the right place that it's supposed to be, whereas a sound check, you're gonna go through, he check every line and then do a whole song or even just part of a song to make sure that this house, sound in the house is good, but more importantly, to get your monitor mix going on stage because the line check, you don't really know what it's gonna sound like because you've only heard each thing by itself. Yeah, and that that's rough, and we'll we'll get we'll get to that. Uh, you know, line check is better than nothing. You usually, you know, at, at the Oasis, it's it's a very modified line check. You know, we where each band usually doesn't get full advantage to to a sound check just because the shows are once the show's running, you gotta you gotta get on there as fast as you can and get get things moving. No no one no one enjoys a long set change, and uh, what's even worse is when you have a long set change and then you're sitting through a sound check. And it's just like just just play, you know. At a certain point, you just you'd rather hear them play and have the sound guy mix it on the fly, as opposed to trying to get everything set up ahead of time. And that gets rough too, because if you eat up even five minutes more of your sound check time 
than was allotted. If that's either that time's either coming off of your set or the band playing after you, and I, I guarantee you that's going to make nobody happy. Yeah, you know we we've kind of like pounded this as best we could. Uh, it's all about relationships. You know, you're, you're trying to establish networks and relationships, not only with the, the, you know, professionals at the venue that you're working with, but uh, as well as the other band bandmates, musicians that you're going to be playing with. And you, you don't want to miss out on a potential cool show because some other band got the wrong impression of you because you had a, you, you spent the entire sound check taping your pedals to the floor. Um, okay, getting on stage. Uh, bring your gear up quickly. And don't, you know, ideally it should, for the most part, be all set up, you know, focus. Once, once you start the process of getting everything on stage, just, just get it on stage and get it working. Um, you know, and, you know, in theory, if you, if, you, if you get like your guitar and your pedal board on stage and you start working on that stuff, uh, and all of the other gear isn't on there, you're making it very difficult for everyone else to do their jobs. So make sure that everyone loads up the gear, hopefully the majority of it's already previously been set up, and then start making sure it's all, all working, all set up. But don't, like I said, don't just bring a couple pieces on, start working on that, go back to the garage or the you know backstage, grab a couple more, just bring it all up, get it going. Yeah. It's it, it really all this, most of this stuff boils down to time management. It's the the more things you can do to save time, on on the front end of it, the the quicker everything's gonna be, the easier it's gonna be for you, and then the more time you'll have to play. Yeah, that that's that. Usually, you know, your your setup time is just gonna eat into your your performance time, and so just try to try to get it down to a science. Uh, I've referenced this band a couple times. Hidden Hospitals. They played here, you know, last year. Uh, and on top of just being like one of the sickest, tightest bands that I've seen here, um, they had a ton of gear, like a shocking amount of gear, uh, and the shortest set change I've ever seen in my entire life because it was all set up and ready to go, including their in-ear rig. They got it up on stage. They, were, they probably got the full band ready to go on stage in under 10 minutes. Uh, I, like, I was like, you guys need help with every, anything? They're like, no, we're ready to go. Let's do it. They're like, who are you guys? They're robots. Math Rocky robots, my favorite kind. Um, so, uh, okay, this is in capital letters. Uh, no noodling. Like, Please. I know. Yeah, I know you just learned the intro riff to Master of Puppets, but this is not the time or the place. Okay. Uh, <laughs> same goes for drummer or drummers. You know, like you're working on the intro riff to Meshuggah's Bleed. Uh, you know, with your double kick. Uh, don't do it. Save it for the ride home. Yeah, it's it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it's just one of those things nobody but you wants to hear it. I, it's, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of communication that's trying to happen. You know, sound guy is trying to communicate. Or, yeah, maybe with a, a stage tech, or maybe the sound guy is trying to ask what you want in your monitor. But you just hear, you know, these pinch harmonics in the background, and the guy who just got the new Floyd Rose guitar. And it's you know, dive bomb sounds. Check this out, guys. When that's just again, it's it's the same thing as time. You know, it's part of your time management. Just make sure that you are efficient when you get on stage. You're trying to help the sound guy. Yeah, and and with that too, the drums especially. Uh, if if the guy, sound guy is coming up and like putting mics on your kit and you're hitting the snare while his head is two feet from it, he is not going to be your friend for very long. It's uh, it, it's it's actually kind of surprising how often that happens, and I not, not I, and I, I try to always be nice about it, but it's like the, I need these to do the thing that you want me to do, so just chill for a minute. Yeah, uh, sadly though they're drummers, right? So that even if it's written, it's it's probably not going to get through to them. <laughs> uh, okay, um, yeah, but you know, on, honestly, like. Drum, drums are especially hard, and I know drummers are, you know, they want to tune up and, and they want to make sure everything is working, and, and that's, that's part of it. But you can still figure out if everything is working when the sound guy says, okay, give me your kick drum. Give me, give me your snare drum. And, and during this part, I've seen too many drummers do this, and I think, I think they think it's a smart thing, but it's really not. Any, anything that you do that will impact the, the stage sound, like guitar players, you know, you, you, you sound check and then 
you, you go to play like after your first song, you you cruise over to your amp and you bump up the volume a little bit. You know, that's rough. You could ask the stage uh, or the sound guy to turn up your monitors if you need some guitar in your monitor. Um, but drummers, something I always see is it's like, hey, give me give me your your snare drum, and they're just like they're just like gently dropping the the drumstick on the snare drum, and like, hey, hit it hit it as hard as you'll hit it, and they keep doing it. And then when it comes time for uh, the actual song, you know, they they're suddenly the Incredible Hulk, and they're they've got Louisville sluggers, and they're hitting the snare drum, and everyone in the audience cringes because it's so loud. Uh, you know, it. In theory, if you if you do this, if you if you sound check correctly, and you you try to keep it as consistent as possible, that's giving the the sound guy all the tools that they're going to need to make you sound good. So. Um, Okay, stage volume. Uh, this is this is smart, and it's something that no one ever thinks of. Uh, and that Gary wrote this. I'd, I'd love to take credit for it. Ask the engineer what they recommend. It's I know it's crazy, you know, but like I feel like a lot of bands kind of walk into a place and feel like, oh, I know, I think I know where I should be, you know, whether it's in terms of volume or, you know, the overall overall band sound or maybe you know what the you know, stage layout, what he would recommend, you know? Just go up and say, hey, what what do you recommend for, for us to, you know, in terms of our stage, overall stage volume? Yeah, it's it, it, it depends so much on the room that you're in. Um, I have, uh, I, I, back in the, when I was doing sound here, there were a couple bands that came through that uh, they, they just, they wanted their amps so loud that I didn't even end up putting them in the PA at all. And it ended up working because this room is small enough that if you just use the drums, it comes through and everything. And it's the same. It's the same everywhere. Like at, at Bottom Lounge, we have had a couple shows. If the room is empty enough, that guitars don't go in the PA at all. And uh, those, it's just so many things you have to take into account. If the room is full, it's going to sound different. If there's less bodies in there, it's going to be a little bit more echoey, and you're probably going to hear that on stage. Yeah, I, I, honestly. Yeah, it's great. It's great to play to a packed house because you know, in theory, you'll be getting paid and sell some merch. But one of my favorite things is just the overall sound. Bodies are great, uh, like absor absorption panels. Easy for me to say, like broadband absorbers. They 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 take up a little more of the frequency, say, than these bricks and tiles that the Oasis uh, has all over the place. On stage, we have uh, you know some some light absorption, so, so that way it kind of kills some of the high end. Uh, because when you'd be up here in a drummer, you know, when you're trying to set up everything and the drummer's hitting the snare drum and the cymbals uh, against the rules here, um, it was really ringy before, and this this actually helps quite a bit. Um, and cool venues like you know ex that really appreciate uh, their room and sound will will try to cover as much surface area that the speakers are going to hit uh, with some sort of acoustic paneling. That's always fun. At the bottom lounge, they they have like chicken wired rolls of the, uh, you know, it's almost like fiberglass insulation yeah. just just up there. I'd love to do that here. If any of you guys work at a place that has fiberglass insulation and loves to donate things to five hundred one c three charities, I'm your guy. Come talk to me after this. And and as far as the stage stage volume thing goes, it's uh, just just little things too. Like uh, I don't, I don't know what is the most popular these days in terms of guitar rigs if you're playing like 412s or uh, like a small combo amp or something. But it, just as simple as if your amp is not higher than your waist, find a way to bring it up so it's shooting at your ears. You, your waist doesn't need to hear, can't hear your guitar tone. So it's kind of stupid to turn it up when it's just sitting right in front of you. You can just angle it and then you don't have to turn up. You hear it just as good and didn't affect the stage volume. Yeah. Yeah, that's smart. Amp stands. If you have an amp case, you can use that. I've seen bands at here just say, "Hey, can I borrow one of these chairs?" Sure. You know, makes our life easier. Go for it. Uh, you know, you can always plan ahead for things like that. When we get to the gig kit, that's further back here. You could even put your amp on the gig kit. But I'd recommend just getting an amp stand so that way you could do like the angled thing. That's why 412 cabs. A lot of them have the angles. So that way those speakers are aimed a little bit higher. Or you can just get the straight ones, so that way you look cool. Because that's why we all do this—to <laughs> look cool. Um, okay, sound check. 
Gary, this is this is your your area of expertise. All right. Um, I mean, assuming that you got set up on stage and you're all ready to go and all the mics are in place and uh, the 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 thing that you have to remember the most is that uh, the way that the engineer is looking at your band is a very broken down, like insulated way. So when he asks you to play the kick drum, he only wants to hear the kick drum, and that's it, it's going to follow the specific order because that's just how we do it. There's no good reason for it, but um, it'll he'll go through your entire drum kit, kick, snare, hi hats, through the toms and everything, and depending on the type of room and how big it is and how high the level of production is, you might have two mics in your kick drum. You might have two mics on the snare. Um, and you have to pay attention to that because based on what's happening, they might need more time. A lot of the times we'll, we'll get drummers that will we'll say kick drum, they'll play maybe like 10 seconds and then stop thinking that we're done. And then we have to wait and go, okay, are they tuning their drum? No. Are they, do they know that they're still supposed to be playing the kick drum? Probably not. This is eating into their sound check time. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, and the, also depending on what room you're in, but um, while you're doing the sound check, that's the best time to start making monitor requests. So if you're standing on stage and you know that you need, if you're say a metal band and you really need to hear that kick drum, uh, Make sure you tell him while he's doing that channel. If he's if he can satisfy your request while he's still there and not five more channels down the line, it's just going to make things go that much quicker. Yeah, um, it's written in here. So like for the guitar player when when they're tuning, and you'll see this a ton. Uh, a guitar player standing there tuning, and you can hear the sound guy say, "Okay, let's hear the kick," and the drummer starts playing the kick. So while he's tuning, you know the guitar player is going to be doing this saying hey in my monitor for this kick drum while while you know while you're here just give me a little more of that kick drum and you know this this means turn it up and this means we're good so use that a lot as often as you can yeah the, the hand signals are, are great I mean I, I don't actually have to talk to most people when I'm doing monitors it's just a lot of like <laughs> and that works just fine um and and also a lot of bands uh, will will make their monitor requests into the mics. You you really don't need to do that. We, like I think that most sound guys are on the lookout for you to be requesting something enough that if you just give him the up or down, he's gonna they're gonna know what you're trying to get across there, and it doesn't make the audience think that there's something wrong. Yeah, that that's always good. You know, tr tr trying to give the impression that the venue is just absolutely doing everything right and everything's great. So if you if you stop and you're like, oh yeah, I was hoping to get a little more kick, you know, then then suddenly the audience is like, Psh, these guys aren't treating the talent with respect, and that's the last thing you want to do. Talent. Okay. Um. So on here it's listed, you know, drums, bass, guitar, keys, vocals, uh, and then. Usually, usually that's kind of the order that sound guys will go through. Uh, it, there's no, like you said, no reason for it. That's just, that's just kind of the standard. So be prepared for that. So drummers, that means you have to be ready first, first and foremost. And the, the only, uh, the two other things with that is, um, when you're, if you if you get a full sound check with nobody in the room and you can actually make requests, especially for the monitor and stuff, don't don't ever ask for more or less drums. Because there, there, there's at any given time at a minimum of six, maybe even to twelve and fourteen different channels of drums. So if somebody says to me, "I need more drums," I don't know what that means. I, that that could be any combination of things. Yeah. And then um. What was the other one? Like kick and snare usually, you know. For, for me, I always kept my monitor mix pretty trimmed down. Kick and snare, bass and vocals. I don't need to hear guitar. You know, hopefully if I'm doing my job right, I don't I'm I'm getting enough out of my amp. And you know, if the other guitar player is kinda all over the map and not playing well, I definitely don't want to hear it. I'm just gonna keep plowing ahead and doing things the way you know, how I know I'm supposed to be playing. So uh it's written on here at one point, you know, just know know what you're what you want ahead of time. And and when you're making making a request, especially for monitors or if you're talking about something that sounds in the house Anything you want to happen phrases a request. If you start saying things like, hey, do this, 
oh, it, it, it just rubs everyone the wrong way. So uh, it, it, it's a lot more helpful to say, can I have more vocals than I need more vocals? So it's just l little little things. It's it's dumb, but it does go a long way is in terms of like relations on stage. Yeah, I believe that. Um, okay, uh, you should know what what your input list is as a band ahead of time. Uh, on the back page here, um, I, I have a couple stage plots. Uh, the site that I used to use for stage plots has, I don't know, not paid for their hosting service anymore or something. But if you Google free stage plots, you'll find a bunch of programs that can help design this. Uh, and you can send this to the venue ahead of time. You can give it to the sound guy ahead of time, or even just uh, like when you get there, if you have something like this, especially the bottom one that has the, the input list, it makes it makes his job a little bit easier. Um, what are your thoughts on having when you do that uh, any specific monitor requests? Um, well, per personally, I actually I, I don't care if they're on there or not. Um, it's one of those things that. When, when I am doing a sound check, it's so much easier for me when you know, s you're know you checking the kick drum if you just put your hand up. I don't need to know ahead of time, okay, the bass player and the stage right guitar want kick drum. It doesn't, it doesn't do me a lot of good because there's nothing I can do ahead of time about that. And in most cases, that's going to be true. Cool. Good to know. Um, so uh, when it comes time to sound check, make sure that your band is all on stage. Uh, it's always rough uh, when you know three fifths of the band is on stage because you know you can't you can't find the bass player, so the singer runs off stage to to go find him, and you're trying to trying to get the sound check rolling, and maybe you can check the inputs, you know, like the line check on the drums, but now you have two people on stage who aren't saying, hey, I need some of that kick drum in the monitor, and that's just going to slow the whole process down. So even though you your instrument isn't being sound checked at that very moment you're still trying to put your monitor mix together. So just, just make sure everyone's on stage. Um, let's see here. Yeah, there's a lot of this we, we already covered. Uh, don't fake out the sound tech. Yes, just to, just to reinforce that. Uh, only play when you're asked. You know, just kind of sit there. I, it's a tedious process, and you know most musicians I know want to noodle. They just want to sit there and you know play some riffs and things like that. Just have a, you know, make sure your volume's off, or don't do it at all, so that way you can be paying attention for your, your monitor monitor mix requests. Uh, let's see here. You have anything to add for that little section? No, not really. Um, I'm looking at the uh, the hearing protection thing. Uh, uh, the, the, if if any of you don't have Sensophonics yet. They're a Chicago-based company. They make custom molded earplugs, and they are the greatest thing there is. Um, they will always fit, and uh, I, I've, I've, I have two pairs. Nothing, nothing bad's ever happened to any of them. They have filters in them so that what you're hearing is just a less volume version of what you would hear without them in. It's not all muffled like with foam or sticking toilet paper in your ears. You hear everything clear. And they sell you different levels of reduction. I have um, minus 30 decibels for when I'm on a really loud stage, but then I've got some minus eights for if I'm just going to a concert and I don't want to blow my ears out. They're, I, I don't know if they're stu still doing student discounts, but when I went and got mine, they, they still might be doing this. You end up spending $250, gets you the exam and the moldings and then the earplugs. It's, it's a small price to pay for knowing that you're going to hear the show better and not you know, destroy your ears. Uh, additionally, it's not, they're not just uh, earplugs. You can actually get them to go on to the end of like your Shure or Sennheiser uh, headphones. If you, if you have uh, you know in-ear monitors and we'll, we'll we'll get to that, but you know you can get them with plugs so that way they just fit right in your ears because uh, I'm sure most of you guys have noticed there's a lot of different headphone in-ear headphone shapes out there and most of them are terrible. I don't think they actually tested them on humans when they tried to put them in. So like you try to put them in and it's like yeah it's okay it sounds okay and then they fall out th things like that. So uh, ear custom ear molds are wonderful. 
the, the last time I was at the the Saint Sensophonics, uh, their their storefront, um, I was picking up my plugs, and the uh, the out box had a uh, a package in there that was Stevie Wonder's in ears. Yeah. So th they're they're really high end for a really good price. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they they always post on Facebook like, oh, Radiohead was in picking up their, you know, their new their new custom molds and all that stuff. And it's it's fortunate that we have them in Chicago and they do it cheap, because they're at other other places that make custom molds, it's not cheap. Not cheap at all. Not that $250 is cheap, but when you compare it, it's pretty reasonable. Yeah, look them up and go get that done. Yeah. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, let's see here. While checking, be conscious of the monitors. Uh, you know, we've kind of covered a lot of that. Um, once the, once the, if you're fortunate enough to have a sound check, you know, after all the lines are checked, uh, they probably will have dialed in a little bit of the EQ uh, on your channels. Then hopefully you'll get you get to play a part of the song or maybe even a whole song. Uh, so it doesn't doesn't hurt to have something just kind of ready to go, like your 30 second sound check song that kind of covers, you know, all of the dynamics of the of what the band will do. So if you have like, you know, a lot of a lot of songs that have like clean intros but really heavy choruses, things like that, it's good to kind of get those out of the way. And then when when you are sound checking, it's always always good to like, especially as a guitar player, you know, strum your cleans, hit your distortion, make sure there's not a drastic jump in either direction, make sure that the volumes are pretty level b between the two. Yeah, and and that goes hand in hand with um, <clears throat> just getting the best sound uh, as your band, because if you're not traveling with your own sound engineer, the the guy in the room, he's never heard you before, he doesn't know what you want to sound like. So if you can give them enough of a range of an idea of what you're going for during sound check, and he can go, okay, they get really heavy like this in some parts, but then they'll dial it back. It, it, it's just, the more information, the better it's gonna go. Yep. Um, Showtime. Uh, this is the fun stuff. Um, showing up on time. Whenever the venue asks, just, just show up at that time. You know, if, if you knew ahead of time that you were going to be playing a show that night and they said you have to get there at 6 o'clock, don't work, you know, till 5.45 and then have to make a 40-minute drive to the venue. Just just try to, you know, arrange it for, for that night. You knew you were going to play a show, take it seriously, get there on time. Uh, blows my mind how many issues, uh, especially the Oasis has, with, with bands that don't show up on time, you know? And... and uh, too, it's it's your advantage if you show up at most of these venues early. You 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 get hospitality beer for free. <laughs> you, you, there's no reason not to wait. <laughs> yeah. Um, set list. Having a set list prepared. Uh, no no audience member likes to see a band sit on stage trying to figure out what song they're going to play. It's it's the worst. It just takes all the steam out of the show. Uh, I I personally you know for me I really like watching bands that have it all all rehearsed they know you know maybe maybe it's on the set list maybe it's not but they know okay we're gonna play two songs we're gonna stop and say hey we're this band from this place with this merch play two more songs hey we got two more left thanks for coming play two songs next band's rule thanks for coming buy our merch buy their merch see ya that those are my favorite because it's it's just professional it's well rehearsed it's fun there's an energy to it but when the momentum and the wind winds out of the sails at a show because the band's just like yeah, uh, you guys want to try playing the new one, or how much time we got left? Yeah, you know, it, time shouldn't be relevant. You know, I, I, it's 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 on here. I, I don't think that bands, for the most part, unless it's like a special event, a CD release show, or something like that, there's probably not a whole lot of reasons to play over over 30 minutes or so. You know, short and to the point. I I want to when the band stops playing, as much as I hate it, I always if if I leave wanting more I will go see them again but if they if they played like nine songs more than I needed to hear at a certain point even the bands that I love it's just like oh and maybe it's because I'm old but it's like man I I wish these guys would have stopped a while ago oh man and, and it's just the truth uh, so keep having a, a well rehearsed short set that's to the point uh, that, that will always leave a, a far more of a lasting impression a positive lasting impression than uh, when you have like you know, hey, we're gonna we're gonna close with this last song, but you didn't tell them that that last song was seventy minutes long. Uh, that's rough. <laughs> that that happens a lot, actually. 
Um, oh, that, they should, those people should be here so we could smack them. The, uh, okay, so the, the next thing is, is definitely something I, I want to mention a lot is, uh, you know, it was standing on monitors and like swinging the vocal mic around by the cord and kicking stuff over. It, it's all very cool, like it, in, if you were playing at CBGB's in 1976, but these days it's, it's so hard for anybody to make money on a show that if you're doing damage to the venue's gear and then they can't do the show tomorrow because of it, it's, it, it, it hurts everybody. And uh, they, they don't want to have you back there. And uh, it, nine times out of 10 too, you're the one that end up having to pay for it. So. Yeah, we, we've, we've had to deal with that here. And, and when that happens, when we have bands that disrespect the gear, we email, like there's an email chain of you know maybe 15, 20 area venues where I'll just be like, Hey, just by the way, this band was very disrespectful. They, you know, they poured water on the monitors, or they're swinging the the mic cable, and, or dropped the mic on the ground, you know, intentionally. It's not, you know. I, I think that's a really important thing to know too. Is that for all of the venues in Chicago, I, I we all know each other. We all talk about the shows that we're doing. Everybody had. You know, we hear all of the crazy stories, so we know. Like, I'll we'll have bands come in that I've never even heard of, but I know from my buddy at over somewhere at you know at Lincoln Hall that okay, they're gonna be a bit of a handful. Um, and as far as like the the mic swinging and stuff goes, that's fine if you bring your own mic and cable. Bless you. <clears throat> yeah, I, I I'm I'm honestly not even that worried about cables most of the time. It's it's the 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 mics and the monitors are the the big ones that they're really hard to repair and even harder to replace. Yeah, um, we're we're fortunate enough that like if, for the Oasis, we knew ahead of time that we weren't going to get exceptionally high caliber bands at all time, and that's that that's the mission. We wanted to make sure that uh, you know younger bands had the opportunity to play on you know a PA system that is you know above the the quality of their band and that and that's fine uh, and we've been fortunate enough so far to only have to make minor repairs I mean this is, a, this is our sixth year and we've only blown a couple speakers and had to replace a couple mics uh, yeah almost everything's identical to when I started here yeah give or take six years ago we replaced all the high frequency drivers and then we put uh, some digital crossovers in the racks that way they're protected that I so like hopefully to hear. widower's sheer stage volume and scream is doesn't doesn't pop anything i'm not I'm not worried I don't think you guys could <laughs> um okay so uh leaving the stage um and this says unless you are the headliner get off as quickly as possible even if you're the headliner you know like personally i just say just get everything off the stage the people who want to talk to you will probably be there in five or ten minutes however long it takes you to get everything off the stage not a, not a terrible not a terrible thing yeah we, we run into this a lot at bottom lines with our headliners is uh you know they're they get done playing and they don't want to take their stuff off they're tired they just played a 90 minute set and i get it but us the sound guys we want to you know go home we're done so we tear everything of ours down, and what's left sitting on the stage is a really lonely-looking drum kit and a couple of amps on standby, with your pedal board still out. And there's, you know, it, there's there's a high chance of somebody, you know, coming up and walking away with something as little as a patch cord, but maybe maybe more, you know. Yeah, sadly. People, don't ever underestimate how how sticky people's hands are at shows. You know, people want set lists and guitar picks, but they also want pedals and drumsticks and spare heads, cymbals, yeah. anything they can walk away with. Yeah, guitar cases, yeah. Really with just guitars a, just in them. a case? No. no. Oh, who is uh, we'll, we'll talk about oh, theft prevention here towards the end. Um, yeah, so, you know, just, if, if, if you're not the headliner, just, just get everything off the stage. The worst thing I see is, you know, the drummer is just like, you know, just finished up. And he's like, oh, yeah, that was a good good event. And, like, you know, the worst is, like, they just get up and walk away, right? You know, they're just like, oh, yeah, you know, just fin finally you know, finally done with this. So let's, let's get out of here. And they just walk off the stage and expect someone else to do it for them. Um, then my next least favorite is when they only they start taking off the cymbals and things like that. Just... You know, let the sound guy take off the mics off the toms. 
you know, assuming that they're clip-on mics, let him do that. If they're mics on stands, just kind of rotate them out of the way and just start getting it out of there as, as fast as you can so that way the next band has an opportunity to sound check. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing possible, in my, in my opinion. You know, carry your whole head and cab off the stage or roll it away uh, best you can. Yeah, and in those moments, I mean, it, like if you are moving a whole half stack by yourself, don't be... Don't be afraid to ask somebody just to give you a hand. Anybody that's around seeing you do that is going to want to help. They, you know, Even if they're an audience member and you just need their hand for a quick second, they're going to be fine with it. Any, anything to make it move faster. Indeed. Um, so, but once you, once you get everything off, off the stage, uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of if you're performing, bringing someone, someone along who kind of knows their role in terms of like, hey, can you stand by this gear while we're getting everything off the stage? Because like he said, stuff at shows is just going to get lifted as often as possible. I just assume that if I don't know you, you're probably going to try and steal my stuff. Uh, and I, I hate that. I hate that. But that's what it is. Chicago now has become, it's like the number one you know, capital in the world for musicians getting their gear stolen. Uh, even Chevelle, not long ago, I mean, maybe a couple years ago, they had s someone just unhooked the trailer from their van and just hooked it onto their truck and just drove off like not not even not even like oh i'm just gonna grab that guitar case that's sitting there like oh i'm just gonna take this whole trailer it's just insane that the that's what chicago has become so please 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 be aware of where your gear is at all times yeah i saw that i saw that but yeah yeah it's it's and you know it, it helps it helps to know where you're playing, you know. Not not to say that, uh, you know, if you're if you're parked in Wrigleyville by the Metro, it's not to say that you're not going to get your car broken into. But it's probably a little less likely than parking near the park in Wicker Park, you know. Uh, that whenever I'm down there with with gear, I am very aware of where all my stuff is, and I just I can't stress that enough. I don't trust I don't trust anyone. Uh, you know, you learn the lesson once, and that should be enough. Yeah, and with a lot of the venues too, um, you're gonna have to park a, a decent amount away. They they're not blocking off parking for your van and trailer. Um, so if you if you're asking yourself the question, is it okay if I leave it in the van? No, no, it's never never okay. Aside from like all of the you know temperament issues with humidity and all that stuff, because I'm a huge nerd for that, and I want to make sure my instruments are in good shape. Uh, aside from all of that. You know, I, you're, if you're playing in Chicago, you're playing at the Rave, uh, it might, might shock you. The area right around the Rave, not wonderful. So leaving your stuff in there, uh, it's, it's, uh, you're rolling the dice. It, uh, it's unfortunate. It's Even unfortunate. going there, you're rolling the dice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Barrier Dead is a, a hardcore band. Uh, and back in, I was in that circle uh, at Victory Records, and... Uh, they they were you know they're 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 a tough angry band and if if you saw any of them like out on a you know dark evening walking down the street you'd be you'd be kind of nervous just be like man that's a scary tough looking guy and uh, they got just mugged and just all their stuff lifted at the rave this is maybe five years ago it's like man they must have been giants to like to like even consider that like what is good oh it's frightening. Okay, uh, but that's besides the point. So yeah, just when you when you load off the stage, just be aware of where your stuff is. Um, okay, miscellaneous random thoughts. Uh, we kind of talked about it. Monitor tips: know what you want. You know, if you have a, a list or like if you have the uh, a stage plot that's relatively consistent, uh, you know, you can put it on there because you're going to be printing it off anyways. You know, Gary's not going to look at it or care that you did, but you might as well put it on there anyways. Uh, Ear protection, foam is crap. You know, it, it, it reduces some volume, but it re it's giving you the impression that it's killing a lot of volume when in reality it's just killing a lot of the high end. Um, you can get like these $15 edematic research. I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly. Edematic. Uh, I have those, they're like 12 bucks, 15 bucks. They're pretty good for 12 or $15. And then Sensophonics, like we talked about, wonderful, wonderful option. Uh, I wish I was a student still, and I'd get a student discount on it. Yeah, me too. Um, less is more. Uh, you know, 
I like having a huge pedal board at home, but when I go to play a show, I trim it down. I keep I keep the stage rig in theory to the bare minimum. You know, I, I don't necessarily bring out a 412 cab because I don't really need it. If there's a, if, you know, hopefully I'm playing a venue that has a microphone and you can put it on there. I'll kind of aim it up towards my head so that way I can hear it. Uh, but you know, keeping it pared down makes it, makes troubleshooting easier, makes it consistent and clean, easy easier to deal with. Um, so, uh, and cheaper isn't necessarily a bad idea either, uh, because if, you know, I, like, I personally, I really like old vintage Fender guitars, but if I was going to be playing a show in, by the subterranean in Chicago, I'd probably bring out a lesser valuable guitar, just because I'd, worst case scenario, if someone steals one of my instruments, I'm going to be bummed, but at least it wasn't one that I really, truly cared about. So uh, Trent Reznor always plays with like these $300 Epiphone Les Pauls because uh, he just destroys them and can go buy a new one real quick. He doesn't necessarily have to be busting out these these cool, rare, old, vintage ones. Yeah, a lot, a lot of um, bands these days, I see uh, the, the most popular guitar amp these days is just a uh, 212 Fender Deluxe, yeah. and that's that. These are you know high-profile touring acts. They get enough of the tones that they want from their pedal board. Bring us tiny amp. They know that they can get a mic in front of it, and if it needs to be louder, they can get in their monitors. It's, uh, and actually these days too, we have the, there's direct in guitars, so you don't even. You know, I've done a few shows lately where there are no amps on stage, and that's. Yeah, we're we're, we're that's, getting that's to that. That's pretty nice that's, too. That's taking the less gear to uh, to the extreme. Uh, but we'll, we'll we'll talk about that. Um, but you know, I, I'm a total total guitar gear nerd. Really, just a gear nerd in general. I don't care what it's for. I think it's cool. Uh, but the the sad reality is, if you buy these, you know, five hundred dollar boutique handmade pickups for your guitar, the audience doesn't know the difference and will never know the difference. So it might sound good. You know, while you're playing at home in your bedroom, you know, the second you play with the band, the quality the quality diminishes a little bit. Uh, now, I'm sure it doesn't diminish, but the the intricacies will get lost. And I, I think it's important to remember that most every venue that is like a rock and roll club that you're going to be at is going to use a Shure SM57 on your guitar. That we describe that mic as the Swiss Army knife because it's the, never the right tool for the job, but it'll do just about anything. So don't worry a whole lot about your guitar tone because it's going through a, a kind of lowest common denominator microphone. Yeah. So. Uh, and we're going to get to this, but bringing your own gear. If, if you see someone bust out an SM57 uh, and you've heard one before, You'll probably think, oh, I wish I brought a, one of my own mics. That would be, that'd be better. So a lot of times, like when I, when I was really performing a lot, we actually had a, a crate of mics that we'd bring just to keep it consistent and make sure that, you know, even if, even if my guitar tone wasn't great, at least you weren't hearing it through an SM57. Uh, Steve, Alb Steve Albini runs a recording studio in Chicago, says he has uh, a crate of 57s around because sometimes people want them, but he just uses it to hammer nails into the walls to hang pictures. And uh, the Bayer 201, which is a really nice di small dynamic microphone, uh, uh, his description on the website for that microphone says, uh, this is what the SM57 would sound like if it was a mic. This <laughs> is awesome. It is a great microphone. It is. Um, Okay, so other less is more. Gain. Uh, even if you're a metal band, you do not need nearly as much distortion as you probably think you do. Less than half as much as you think. Yeah. Not yeah. kidding. Uh, you, you, you lose all your clarity. Uh, you really do. Um, it, now, granted, if you, if you have a, a lower watt amp and you start to crank it a little bit, uh, there's going to be some natural distortion that, that happens. And if that's the case, turn it down even more. Uh, just just less gain, you know. Uh, I remember, you know, just just seeing some bands that I I had perceived as being a fairly heavy guitar sound, and when I saw them live, they were using like the you know one channel Fender amp with like a tube screamer, things like that. And I'm like, man, that sounds huge. And I and that slowly but surely I started to realize, you know, the the huge guitar sound actually didn't have anything to do with the amount of gain being used. You know, it's just getting a good guitar sound, and good guitar sounds rarely have a lot of gain. 
Uh, then I, obviously there's going to be it's going to be different situations. But I mean, the, the, even let's let's take Meshuga. You know, it's probably one of the heaviest bands. They're using eight string guitars, and there's all these chug riffs, right? They're only playing like three notes for that the whole set. Uh, when they're doing all those chug riffs, if they had a lot of distortion, you wouldn't be able to really hear the difference. So, you know, it's shocking, but they don't use a lot of gain. They, ha they have a very tight, mean sound, but it's a far less gain than you might perceive when you listen to it initially. Yeah, there's a, uh, a band we've had come through Bottom Lounge a handful of times called uh, Glass Cloud, and uh, their guitar player uses an eight string, and he spends no less than 45 minutes before the set listening to his rig and, you know, trying to push that gain envelope but make as soon as he starts to lose clarity at any position on his guitar he dials it back and starts over yeah there have been times where like a band will be playing here and i just i just want to walk up on stage and just like just turn their gain down for them i'm like you guys know how good you could sound if you just turn this thing down half half the amount of gain you're using will be better um, this simple attack here. This is just more of a personal preference for me. Uh, I feel like the best band or the best drummers that I hear hit the drums hard and the cymbals soft. Um, it just it's a real consistent sound. Um, you know, drummers that are crashing exceptionally hard uh, that tends to wash out your live mix, and um, it rarely has anything to do with your uh, with the drum mics. It's the vocal mics. Uh, you know, you're Let's say there's a drummer behind me right now. I'm my my head is a good absorbing material here for the the cymbals. But if I start you know rocking out and I want to go do the around the world guitar spin a few times, uh, I'm not going to be right on the mic. So suddenly this the our, the microphone's picking up all of the cymbals. It's picking up all the snare drum, and it blows my mind how many bands aren't necessarily cognizant of that or thinking about like how is how are these three mics at the front of the stage impacting the overall live sound. Cool. And then uh, stage volume, uh, we kind of we kind of talked about this. I remember reading an article about uh, like you uh, you get to a certain point in your like nerd uh, I don't know this this journey of being a, a gear nerd where like reading about like reading an uh, interview with Radiohead kind of cool. Reading an interview with Radiohead's uh, you know sound guy awesome so cool. Because uh, I'm a nerd, and uh, I thought that was fun. And uh, he said the one thing that that Radiohead made a conscious decision of uh, when they were touring on OK Computer is they wanted the people to be able to have a completely normal conversation on stage it, while they were playing. They didn't have to shout. They wanted the stage volume that low because they knew b by the time OK Computer came out, or I'm sorry, yeah, OK Computer, uh, they were probably going to be in it for the long haul. And hearing protection was of utmost importance. So I'm not saying that uh, exit to enter has to have uh, stage volume to where, you know, someone can, you guys can talk to each other easily on stage. Yeah, but <laughs> but at the same time, like, you know, you, seeing if the drummer, like, drummers can play softer but still have a dynamic attack. Uh, it doesn't necessarily always have to be like Animal from the Muppets just beating the drums. Yeah, and uh, that, that that all goes doubly so if you are um, a band with a quiet singer. <clears throat> the <clears throat> the quieter the singer and it just the quieter the source into the microphone, the more we're gonna have to turn it up out there, which means it's picking up all that much more going on behind you. So if it, it it's just all about finding that balance of stage volume because if you're the slightest bit quiet of a singer and the band is still as loud as any other band you're not going to be able to hear the vocal at all in the house and there goes the whole show. Yeah. Yeah, it's d what what often sounds best for the band rarely sounds good for any any one individual instrument. So the guitar sound that you dialed in when the band wasn't hadn't shown up to brand, band practice yet and you're like, god, this is the meanest guitar sound I've ever heard and then the band shows up and you get lost in the mix. It's because your guitar sound wasn't good for the band. It was just good on its own. Uh, and it blows my mind that you see like you know four individual musicians who have not heard their own band perform before, and they're just like, man, this guitar sound is awesome. But like, yeah, but you just murdered the singer. You know, they're never we're never going to hear the vocals because you spent so much time on the guitar sound. And and, and just be aware of what your band sounds like. Uh, 
Tadashi, uh, you know, local band would be a great example. Jeff, the singer, good singer, uh, but quiet. You know, it, like he just didn't project the way other singers do. Uh, but the guitar player often had like a full stack or more multiple cabs on stage, and it was it was a battle. It was a battle to make that happen. They still sounded good. That guitar sound was huge, but you know, at a certain point, you gotta you gotta wonder what's best for the overall overall sonic picture. Um, okay, mic proximity. We kind of talked about that, uh, and knowing knowing what if you're singing into an SM58 knowing what the, the overall proximity is, or if you are a Sennheiser guy, or maybe you don't know. Uh, if you have the chance, go to a guitar center and you know, get a, this is all you need. You need a, a wedge and a mic, and you can, you can hear what you sound like through a few different microphones, and then you can start to feel where the mic proximity ends up, you know, side to side or back, how far it goes. Uh, it's good to know, and the best singers that uh, you know, I've seen you, when they're singing, they're not necessarily just on the mic the whole time. You know, when they're going to be shouting, they back off just for a split second. And knowing how to control that that dynamic mic proximity can can really make the sound guy's life a little bit easier, uh, as well as make your you know make your performance a little more controlled. Yeah, um, there the two big things with that is with. 99% of vocal mics, they're, and this is where it gets a little nerdy, they're, they're dynamic microphones, this is the way that they're built. One of the side effects of being a dynamic microphone is this proximity effect of low end, so that the further you get away from it, the low end drops off, and the closer you get to it, you get a lot more low end. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're singing on a mic. Yeah, the, the engineer is going to EQ bad notes out if there's like a big woofy thing going on that he doesn't want. Um, and then the other thing is uh, if you are a singer who doesn't play an instrument, don't ever do this. Do, do you hear how much it changes when I'm doing this? It sounds terrible. And I guarantee you, the the guy at front of house is doing everything he can to make what you're to negate what you're doing to make it sound like a normal microphone, and it helps none at all. It looks really cool, and you look really cool when you're holding the cord with it too. What if I have to say breakdown? Uh, it, it, don't don't say it at all. Um, <laughs> that was the only right answer. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, don't cup the mic. Okay. I, I refer to it as palm muting the microphone, and it does the exact same <laughs> thing to the mic as it oh, does to the guitar. That's amazing. That is absolutely amazing. I've never heard that. That's good. You can have that one. Okay. Done. Okay. Uh, having your own rig in, in, in one capacity or another, and I'm not talking about what guitar stuff or drum stuff you're bringing out. Um, if, you, if you really are a singer and you sing a lot, have your own vocal mic, right? You don't know who was singing before you, you know. They might have Ebola, you know. This one smells pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this one's awful. Yeah. This, you know what? You know what we're suffering through for you guys. Oh, it's not. It's not pleasant. But uh, bring bring your own vocal mic. Uh, and if you can't bring your own vocal mic, the the little silver mesh ball on a SM58 is like four bucks. So hit Amazon or Guitar Center and just order yourself your own little ball end. We do try to clean them after most shows, but it's only most, and it doesn't always happen. So, yeah. um, okay, if if you have, like you know, we kind of talked about it. If, if there's a if there's a mic that you like on your guitar cab, bring it. You know, I, I would always. For me, I don't like SM57s. Uh, the Sennheiser 609. We have that here at the Oasis. It's like looks like a little tennis racket. Sounds pretty good. Uh, a lot of times I would do that and a, a Shure KSM32 because uh, it sounds great and I wanted to sound good. Uh, and most most sound guys I don't think care if you, if you have it all set up, you know, ahead of time. They're just going to plug that in instead. Or even coming in and saying, "Hey, I have my own mic. Is it cool if I use it?" They're going to go, "Yeah, what do you got?" And they want to talk about it with you. Yeah, because we're nerds, all of us. Yep. Every sound guy is a nerd unless they fell into their job by accident. They're doing it because they love bands and they love shows. So don't ever you got you really got to remember that they're on your team. There's a lot of bands that come in that like they start off with this attitude of like okay, I'm kind of the enemy. Like I'm what's standing in the way of them having a good show. 
when that couldn't be further from the truth. I want their show to be the best show they've played on that whole tour. And I'm going to do everything I can to help it. But I can't, I, I can't walk into every situation telling them that. You know, you just got to know that we're all on the same team. I'm, I'm gonna li- I wasn't going to do this, but I'll let, you, I'll let you in on a secret that always worked well for me. If the sound guy seemed a little grumpy, ask him what band he's in. Because they will just be like, oh, yeah, I'm in this like reggae fusion deathcore it's band. pretty experimental it, yeah yeah you probably wouldn't have any you know you don't yeah, know yeah you, don't know, you have you probably wouldn't know the influences but but like seriously totally changes the the mood and atmosphere so that's i didn't i didn't want every like every sound guy to be asked that all the time because that was my that was my my personal like oh this guy this guy's gonna be rough better better ask him what band he's in uh but yeah it works it's just a nice icebreaker um, okay, so if you bring your mics, uh, if you're a band that has any sort of like electronic equipment, if you're going to bring a computer or a MIDI keyboard or whatever it is, br- have a DI box ready because you never know. Like the, the, the Oasis has four DIs uh, because hopefully that's enough. But w- a couple times it wasn't enough, it, which is ridiculous because, you know, it's like, oh, you know, every, every person in the band has their own computer. Like, What? Okay, you know, you, like, so if, if you're an electronic musician, bring a stereo DI. You know, don't just bring a mono DI, bring a stereo DI. Same thing if, you're, if you have uh, a really nice keyboard. You know, I've seen people bring these, like, really fancy $3,000 electric, you know, electric pianos or Nords or whatever it is, and they have them, you know, they, they're just like, yeah, just whatever DI you have. Or maybe they brought their own DI and it's just a mono DI, and it's like, you just cut the functionality of that thing in half. Why would you do that? Just, you know, it just plan ahead. It reminds me of when I was like DJing, we would go to electronic shows here, mm-hmm. and everybody would be like, I was the only one prepared because I was the only one that knew what needed to go into the DI boxes. And they were like, oh, can we use your gear? I'm like, I guess. Yeah, it's. Like, you should know what you're plugging into the DI box. Yeah, and that goes back to knowing your input list, what you what's needed, you know? Hey, I'm like, I don't think any venue is expecting you to bring your own DIs, but just to, you know, just to make things easier, just having everything set up. Again, referencing Hidden Hospitals playing here, they had it all ready to ready to go right off the bat because they had their own DIs. It's like, oh yeah, this was the bass mic. I just plugged it in. Everything was just ready to roll. Makes life easy. Yeah, and and know for certain things if you're running mono or stereo, that's just good to know offhand too. Yeah. I mean, if if. If I if I walk up to somebody says that keyboard mono or stereo and they don't know then that's uh, that's a hold, that's a hold up until uh, yeah th- then then it becomes mono and that's yeah, all you get yeah re- yeah regardless it's mono now you don't know you don't deserve stereo uh, direct guitar rigs um, now I'm not necessarily talking about bringing a pod to a show but there's actually some pretty cool advancements in technology uh, there's a there's a couple different ones and they they kind of range in price. Palmer was the I think the first brand that really started to do this on a consistent basis. But they make these these devices uh, that essentially like a cabinet simulator. You plug your head into the the Palmer box and then out of the Palmer box into your cabinet. So the your guitar rig is, operates normally, but then you take a, an XLR cable and run it to the front of house so that way they're getting a just a, a live raw feed of your guitar sound um, some of them don't sound great uh, but the the one that I wrote on here the radial JDX uh, I have that it's terrific and I think I got it for like a hundred and fifty bucks or maybe less and if you think that the sound is gonna be suspect or you only have a, an SM57 Available, uh, it's like eh, it's worth a shot. God. Yeah, the JDI is an Active Direct box, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, ra- Radio makes a ton of great stuff. The, especially in the past two years, they've been coming out with uh, a, a DI for any application. Yeah. So if you're, especially if you uh, are a band that has like an iPod intro or something like that, they make a DI now that has the eighth inch iPod cord attached to it. You don't need to buy another one to plug into it. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're a pretty cool company and, and all, their, all their boxes are assembled with, uh, like you, they could probably fall out of a plane and still be, be okay. They're, they're pretty cool. Um, 
so uh, that that's an option. You know, the the band that I'm I'm currently jamming in, if in theory we decide to play a show someday down the line, all of us actually have JDX boxes because they sound great. Like I, I threw. I have a YouTube video on my Greg's Guitar Lessons YouTube channel, shameless plug, and it has, uh, it, it compares, I think it was an SM57, uh, a, a $1,000 Shure KSM44, you know, condenser mic, and the JDX. The JDX sounds shockingly good. Like, Kevin, you were there. Shockingly good. Yeah, like, considering it's like, hmm, should I spend $1,000 on this microphone or 100 bucks on this direct box? Yeah, I was sold. And that's actually, uh, if you are a band that is trying to get as much gain as you can out of your guitar signal, the, the direct in is a much better way to go because you're going to just get that clean signal then as opposed to a mic which is picking up, you know, characteristics of the speaker based on where it's positioned, the rest of the band that's on stage. It's not coming through a lot, but it, it is coming through. Yeah. Um. So bring in your own PA, uh, you know, that, that, that's probably a whole other meeting, talking about, you know, buying and building your own PA rig. Um, but some, something that, uh, you know, you can consider is if you don't think they're going to have a, a monitor, bring a, bring a vocal monitor, just, you know, just so that way the singer can hear themselves. Uh, because if they can't, they might be off time or out of pitch, and that's... Everyone loses then. Uh, and then the, the other thing you can do is, uh, and Griffin does this, is just a single uh, in-ear monitor system just, just for the singer. Just, you, you just plug the microphone into a splitter, and it splits the signal. One, one goes to the in-ear system, and the other goes off to the front of house. So that way, you know, they don't have to worry about pointing at Gary, you know, for vocals the whole show. They can just do it on their own. Um, so in-ear rigs, if you, you know, I kind of get a quick little bullet point as to uh, what you would need. Usually it starts off with a mic splitter. Uh, or like, you know, you'll have your own mixer on stage. Um, and then all of, the, all of the mics that are up here would get plugged in to a mic splitter in your rack. And... Uh, that's all wired in, so half of it is just going right to your mixer. The other half, you can just have it all listed and, eat and help the sound guy say, okay, here's, you know, plug the kick. This is, this is our input, kick, snare, guitar, guitar, bass, vocal, vocal. Uh, and then, in theory, you could mix your own, your own uh, in-ear sound, IEM, that's the in-ear in -ear monitor. Uh, you can go through and dial it dial it in and it, the goal is to have consistency from show to show um, so mic splitter usually a snake of some sort for the for all the mic cables to go from one place to another um, there's usually some sort of a monitor station or the, the rack that is sending out the ind individual mixes uh, to each each person and if you, hopefully your mixer will allow it so that way each band member can kind of dial in their own personalized mix yeah, they, they, it's getting more and more popular all the time, um, especially with digital consoles now. Um, you, you can you can get pretty pretty cheap ones. I mean, they're they're like a thousand dollars or so, but for a digital console that they're normally around twenty five, thirty thousand dollars, you can actually accomplish a stage sound that'll you know be better than what a lot of other bands are doing and get away with it for pretty cheap. Yeah, I, I don't know where. Uh Dan from Libria went. I was hoping he'd still be sitting here when we talked about this because he just built himself a very nice, uh, you know, in-ear rack system. So if if he hasn't left us totally, uh, we'll uh, we'll shake him down afterwards. Um, okay. In case of a bad or rude sound guy, we kind of talked about that. You know, kill him with kindness. Do everything according to the procedures in here. Be as you know receptive and. Uh, kind as you can and that's for the most part that's all you can do but what you don't want to do is burn any bridges because who knows where that sound guy is going to be working next week because like you said you work for a company that has yeah. you at bottom lounge and subterranean or like there was a last last winter um i i did a show at lake forest college and there was a band called heavy times that came through 
and uh, we sound checked them. They were our headliner. We sound checked them. Everything went great. And then they left, and they had six hours to kill, so they went to the bar. They came back, and because of how drunk they were, were uh, furious at me for everything. Nothing was actually happening or going wrong, but they just wanted somebody to be mad at. So that went horribly. The show went really bad. Everyone was yelling at each other. Um, And then maybe three months ago, they came into Bottom Lounge, and they didn't remember me. But (laughs) I, I, I told them who I was, and, uh, they they couldn't have been more embarrassed. It you could, I, I I saw it immediately on their faces that they know like oh man, we we did not mean to be like that. And it's it's because it finally came around to them. They they you know they realize that the way the way you're gonna act to one person it, it's it's you don't get to leave that show and forget about it forever, although it feels that way. Yeah. Well, good. I'm glad they learned their lesson. Yeah. Uh, okay, hey, and, and like, if if you were going back to a venue that had a, a terrible sound guy and nothing worked and like you tried to do everything by the book and it was still terrible, just bring your own. Uh, you can usually hire them fairly cheap, uh, unless you're Gary. He he, he commands the big bucks. It's not that days. expensive. Give me some money. I'll do sound. <laughs> there we go. Next next time you need you need sound and event, give and that, Gary money. That's really sound. helpful too if you are. Um, if you're looking for specific cues on things, if you're the kind of band where it's like, okay, well, this song, the keyboard needs to be prominent, but on this song, you know, it's it's vocals, and you need to verb up the snare a lot. You can give notes and stuff like that to a house sound guy if you give him a set list and write maybe two or three notes per song, but that's going to be about the limit. Past that, you're going to... You want somebody who knows your band, who is, you know, a, and as much a part of your band as, as you are at that point. Uh, it's a, it's an important one. Any any of the bigger shows that my old band played, we'd always bring out our own tech, uh, just because we could we could go over it with them ahead of time. Say, okay, yeah, you know, turn <laughs> turn Greg's vocals down as low as you can get. Make sure they're audible, but just you don't want to hear them. You don't want to hear the notes. Okay, ah, uh, so the gig kit. This is an important one. Uh, the the collection of stuff that will break at a show is is an impressive list and you can't bring a backup for everything but uh, I've, fa- I've been fortunate enough to find you know I've trimmed it trimmed the list down uh, you know o- over the years so uh, I usually start with a Tupperware box and not a clear one because those especially in Chicago winters uh, they it gets cold and those things can fracture if bumped the right way so I usually just get the gray ones because those are a little more durable uh, uh, extra strings, sticks, picks, anything that you're probably going to need in there. Uh, C- cables. If you are playing any instrument that needs a quarter-inch cable, bring three more than you need in your rig. I'm, yeah. I'm not joking. One more isn't going to do it, especially if you're playing a keyboard and you're using a DI and you say, I have my cable to get to the DI. You can't bet on the house. Because you know what? The, the, the quarter-inches that we have at the venues we got because they were left there. Yeah. And we don't know how well they work. We're going to grab the first one that's in the drawer and throw it up, and hopefully it passes signal. If it doesn't, we'll try another one. But after two or three tries, we're going to go, wait, why don't you have yours? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, isn't our, this isn't our responsibility. Um, yeah, really, I mean, he said it best. One extra, at the very minimum, one extra for everything that you have in your rig. So if you have 40 pedals on the stage... Uh, that's a lot of extra backup cables, but I mean, you know, really little p- pedal connectors. If you have ten or fifteen in your bag, it's not a not a terrible idea. I've but, seen a lot of shows go down because of a of a pedal board situation. Yeah. Uh, um, th- there was a, a fest last summer that our headliner spent twenty minutes. I'm not joking. Twenty minutes pulling out a cable and didn't didn't stand by his amp either. So you just heard the. Unplugging and plugging back in for 20 minutes in front of about 3,000 people. Yeah, that's smooth. Um, yeah, so like if if you you know if you have a head in a cab, bring an extra speaker cable. Uh, you know, maybe bring one for the bass player too, especially if they have uh, you know Neutrik. That's a common connection, not just quarter inch speaker cables. If they have a Neutrik, you know, make sure that you have an extra one because those are going to be those are going to be harder harder to come by. Uh, so. 
And know the difference between speaker and uh, instrument cable too. That's, that's it, it gets confused a lot, and uh, it's it's really easy to confuse if you're not paying attention. But not Neutrik, speak on. That's what I meant to say. The speak on, like on the back of an Ampeg, you know, A10 cabinet. Uh, Neutrik yeah. does make the speak on. Yeah, that's I know. That's what. I'm, um, so fuses. If your amp has fuses, know what fuses those are, and uh, then have some. Just have a pack of them. It costs five, ten bucks, and put that in your in your uh, in your box here. Uh, a notebook, you know, for set lists. If you forgot to make one before you go for merch prices, uh, Sharpie because that can write on everything ish. Duct tape because it fixes and saves everything. Just just everything. Uh, a note to that though, um, if you're going to be taping stuff to anything at the venue, like the floor or the wall, ask for gaff tape. It is. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's it's very much like duct tape, but the adhesiveness doesn't leave any residue or anything. You can peel it off. It's just as sticky, but it peels off and doesn't leave anything. And uh, it's, it's, it, it's great. It's it's preferred to duct tape because duct tape leaves all that the strings and everything. Well, I, yeah, well, I just more meant for you know personal. Oh yeah, sure. I'm I'm just stuff. saying for like when you're taping your set list down on the ground, and then when you're done and you rip it up and you leave that extra strip of duct tape there, I'm the one that has to get peel that up. Uh, like this black duct tape here. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, gaff tape. <laughs> it's good. Yeah, it's it's true. Well, that 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 says a lot about bottom launch. We never have gaff tape. <laughs> <laughs> um. So uh, this is, might seem crazy, but just a cheapo guitar strap. If you have an extra one, just bring it. Uh, I, uh, maybe a couple years ago, one of my students had built his gig kit. And I'm like, you got everything? He's like, yeah, I got everything but the strap. Should be good. Next show, he's playing on stage. I just watched the strap just rip. Like, just the, the hole just tore out. And he's just, so anyone got a strap? And it's just like, well, you could have, man. Just, you know, it's four bucks. It's worth it. A uh, cheap tuner, uh, and this is a lot easy, or a lot easier these days because you can get like little snark clip tuners uh, for ten bucks, and they're great. Uh, Reverb.com, a Chicago online startup, is making clip tuners, and I think they're like three dollars shipped if you live in Illinois. Uh, so no, no reason not to. Uh, the mic windscreen, and I'm not necessarily talking about the foam thing that's going to go over it, but just the actual metal windscreen itself. Uh, extension cables, you know, bring them. And this is just a personal thing. I get get black ones. No, nothing nothing looks worse than when you have you know this band that has like huge banners and all this stuff to make themselves look super professional, and then orange cables all over the stage. <laughs> it's like yeah, come on like guys, some bad Christmas decorations. Yeah, exactly. Uh, power strips. Um, you never know. Hopefully you don't need them. You know, the Oasis was built by a bunch of nerdy musicians. Uh, so like there's there's outlets all over the place and built into the stage which makes things easier but not every venue has that so uh, if you're gonna be using a, a handful of uh, different things that you have to plug in and then they only have one outlet on your side of the stage you'll be thankful you have a power a power strip and if you are using a power strip tape down the reset button I, I've I've seen shows where it gets stepped on somebody in the audience puts their drink down on it and there goes your guitar rig ouch yeah. And the good thing you have the fuses in there, too, because after they destroyed the fuse, when they shut off the power to a loud amp. Um, so a towel for when some uh, idiot in the crowd spills his water or other beverage on your stuff. Pedal board, it'd be nice to have a towel. Uh, batteries, whatever, whatever rig or whatever uh, gear that you have that needs batteries, bring extras of that. So I'm looking at you active bass players.